Hello, um, and welcome today to today's webinar that provides a summary of a new guide on using the Bayesian framework for interpreting findings from impact evaluations. My name is Lauren Schur, and I'm a senior researcher at Mathematica. And my colleagues, Mar Marielle Finucan and John Dakey, are the lead authors of this new guide, and they'll be presenting to you today. Uh, we'd like to thank the Institute of Education Sciences, IES, the Society for Research on Educational Effectiveness, SRI, and the Association for Public Policy Analysis and Management, APAM, for co-sponsoring today's event. Um, I'll soon turn this over to Matt Soldner, Commissioner of IES's National Center for Education Evaluation and Regional Assistance, who will get us started by talking about the genesis of this work. And then the guide's authors will dive into the key recommend recommendations offered in the guide. Um, I would like to ask you to keep your microphones muted. You can use the chat function to pose any questions you might have. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we can following the presentation. I'd like to let you know that this presentation is being recorded, which you probably heard. Um, and you'll receive an email with the link as soon as that's available. So with that, I'm going to pass this on to Matt to get us started. Hey, thanks, Lauren, and thanks to everyone who's joining us today. It is really my pleasure to offer IS's thanks to our authors and to our wonderful co-sponsors um, for today's presentation and this wonderful guide. Next slide, please. Um, dun, 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 dun. I think that's what you're supposed to do when you see those little, um, those little horns or megaphones there. Um, IES is really pleased to release um, the Bayesian or Bayesian Interpretation of Estimates Framework for Interpreting Findings from Impact Evaluations, a practical, and I'll underline practical because it truly is, a practical guide for education researchers. Um, next slide. This is part of a larger effort that I hope everyone on the call is already aware of, IES's SEER principles. Um, now, almost three years ago, Mark Schneider, our director, um, talked about uh, the idea of having um, a series of standards and recommendations that complement our already well-known WWC standards that focus on internal validity to kind of round out uh, some other concepts that we believe, um, if researchers can implement them, will go a long way to making sure that impact research is truly actionable. And so as part of Mark's effort, we've commissioned a series of papers around the SEER principles that you see um, listed on the left side of your screen. If you haven't dug into them, um, go to ies.ed.gov slash SEER to learn more. This guide is really squarely within um, kind of the outcomes camp. If you go online and take a look at our discussion of outcomes, we focus a lot on what um, a high quality outcome measure looks like, but didn't talk as much until this guide came out um, about ways for researchers to think about how they communicate um, impact findings with the public, uh, policymakers, educators, other stakeholders who need to make sense of the high quality and good work that you do. So we are really proud that Mary Ellen John were able to do this work. It's a wonderful addition to the field. Um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to them both to dig in and begin today's presentation. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Matt. I'm just going to give a little overview of what we're going to cover today, and I'll hand it over to Mariel to kick us off. Uh, so what we're going to cover today, first, I want to, we're going to talk about the use cases for BASI. When would you want to use this thing? Second, we're going to talk about why you would want to use Bayesian interpretation of estimates, BASI, for those use cases. The third topic covered today is we're going to go through the components or the steps of applying this framework in the context of education impact evaluations. And then finally, we're going to give a, a little demo, technology willing, of a spreadsheet tool that we're providing to help you calculate the probabilities that we'll be talking about today. So those are the topics, and I will turn it over to Mariel. Thanks, John. Thanks, Matt. So our first topic, when would this be a useful framework for you to use in your own research? The first use case, imagine that you're conducting an impact evaluation. You have produced an impact estimates, which could, for example, be a difference in means between a treatment and a control group. And you've done a lot of the hard work already. You've designed this evaluation really carefully. You've collected all of your data. You've run your regression to calculate that impact estimate. Now you're holding that impact estimate in your hand and wondering, 
have I found finally found an intervention that can really move the outcomes uh, that I care about? Is this something real or is it just a fluke? And you've heard perhaps that p-values aren't the perfect tool for answering that question. Another use case, maybe you're not actually running the impact evaluation yourself, but rather you're reading an impact evaluation report or a manuscript. And likewise, you're wondering, I see these impact estimates presented in the report or the manuscript, what should I make of them? Are these something real that I should care about or are they just flukes? And again, you've heard that p-values might not be the right job. So those are our use cases. And now we want to hopefully help you come to agree with us that BASI is a really good tool for this use case. In particular, we want to first talk about why p-values aren't a good tool, why a lot of researchers are being told to reject statistical significance testing. And then secondly, we want to talk about how bringing prior evidence can really improve your uh, your outcomes in, this, in these use cases, really improve how you're interpreting these impact estimates. Okay, so the first one, researchers are being told to reject statistical significance testing. And this has come from way up high. For example, in 2016, the American Statistical Association released a statement, it's shown here, on the widespread misinterpretation of p-values and statistical significance. We're going to talk in a lot of specifics about what that misinterpretation looks like in a bit. Then three years later, the journal, the American Statistician, released an entire special issue talking about what does life look like after focusing on p less than 0.05 as this bright line? What can we do better? And then in that same year, the wonderful journal Nature published a commentary that had more than 800 signatories about rising up against statistical significance. So all of this to say is that there's really a lot of a lot of agreement that p-values aren't a great tool for interpreting impact estimates. And why is this? Why do we reject statistical significance? The first reason is that statistical significance really doesn't play well with uncertainty. It leads to these overconfident thumbs up or thumbs down decisions in our conclusions, depending on whether p is less than 0.05 and we celebrate or p is greater than 0.05 and we despair. Secondly, this is an issue that I'm sure you guys have heard a lot about. Statistical significance is not the same thing as substantive significance because, of course, the size of the impact estimate and not just its p-value matter a lot. Next, p less than 0.05, this kind of culture, has created an incentive structure that really contributes to this replication crisis, wherein really seminal findings, unfortunately, sometimes fail to replicate. And that's due both to publication bias, where statistically significant findings tend, up, tend to end up in the literature, but also to these researcher practices like p-hacking and data mining, which really are, you know, incentivized under this structure. Last but not least, as we will discuss in some more detail soon, um, all of the issues listed above are really salient in, in small studies. And I think in those studies, it is particularly hard to interpret uh, impact estimates using statistical significance. Dan? Thanks, Mariel. So underlying all of these issues with statistical significance is really the misinterpretation of what p-values and statistical significance mean. And so on these few slides, I'm gonna start off by describing what p-values mean, just as a reminder, and then I'm going to painstakingly dissect what they don't mean. Um, and I'm gonna violate the rules of good presentation, and I'm actually gonna read things from the slide, which you're never supposed to do. But the problem with p-values and statistical significance is if you don't say it exactly right, there's a pretty good chance you're gonna get it wrong. So uh, forgive me as I, uh, upset our communications director and read from the slide. So what a p-value is, when we calculate the difference in mean outcomes between the treatment and control groups, we get our impact estimate for our study. That's a specific number based on data. And I'm gonna call that delta my estimate. The p-value is the probability that an estimated impact greater then my estimate occurs by chance when the true impact is zero. 
So we assume that the true impact is zero. And then we calculate the probability that if we randomly assigned our subjects over and over and over again, and recorded an impact estimate each time, it's the fraction of those estimates that would be larger than the one that we actually have, the one that we are holding in our hand. That is what a p-value is. And that's what's described in the math on the graph. Uh, it's the same as the second bullet. So we could go to the next slide. So what isn't a p-value? Well, the p-value is not the probability that the true impact is zero. We assume the true impact is zero in order to calculate the p-value. The second thing that it is not, which is actually really just a restatement of the first thing, but sometimes folks think they're saying something different, the p-value is not the probability that the estimated impact is attributed to randomness alone. We assume that it's attributed to randomness alone when we calculate the p-value. Um, so just to really hit this hard, the p-value is the probability and estimated impact greater than my estimate occurs by chance when we assume that the true effect is zero. Let's go to the next slide. So that's p-value interpretation and misinterpretation. What is statistical significance? Well, the correct interpretation is, and again, I'm gonna read from the slide, when the true effect is zero, there is a 5% chance that an impact estimate will be statistically significant. All right, so in all the cases where we're studying something that doesn't work, the p-value will be less than 0.05, 5% of the time. That's what that means. Misinterpretation. When the impact estimate is statistically significant, there is a 5% chance that the true effect is zero. Now, I want to point out that these two statements sound very similar. They use almost exactly the same words. We just put those words in a different order. Uh, in one, some words come before the comma, whereas in the other, they come after the comma. But that arrangement of the words actually really matters. It's not, it's not just a semantic misinterpretation. Um, and we are going to provide an example of the magnitude of that misinterpretation. So I'm going to hand it back over to Mariel. Thanks, Jen. So in this example of how big that misinterpretation uh, can be, what we're hoping to convince you in, of is that you can solve this misinterpretation problem and get something more useful out of your analysis by bringing in prior information. But first, to do what John promised and talk about the magnitude of this misinterpretation, let us start with an example. Imagine in this hypothetical example that federal grants, maybe from IES, have funded 100 locally developed programs. And the truth, which the decision maker or the researcher or the policymaker does not know, hidden from that person, is the fact that 10 of these 100 programs have meaningful impacts and 90 of them have no impact at all. And we would love to be able to evaluate all 100 of them, unfortunately, due to limited budgets. We're going to conduct a randomized control trial for one of those 100 locally developed programs. We're going to randomly select one to evaluate. That's the bad news. We only can evaluate one. The good news is that we are going to do a bang up job in this evaluation. It's going to be randomized, as I already said, so we won't have to worry about confounding bias. That's great. We're going to do statistical testing with alpha equals 0.05, a nice stringent standard threshold. And we're going to power our study well. We're going to get enough folks included in our study with a big enough sample size that we will have 80% chance of detecting a meaningful effect. So just keep a few numbers in your head as I switch slides. There are 10 out of 100 true, truly effective interventions. Alpha equals 0.05 and power equals 80%. OK. So we're going to reach into the jar here, and we're going to pick one intervention to evaluate. And that one study that we're going to conduct is going to fall into one of four categories. So let's talk about each of those categories. The best case scenario is that we are evaluating a truly effective intervention, and we find a statistically significant impact estimate. This is going to happen in the eight out of the 100 cases, because remember, we have 80% power to detect a true effect if it's there. And there are 10 truly effective interventions. So 80% power times 10 
real impacts gives us the eight green marbles. Unfortunately, for the remaining two truly effective interventions, we have one minus power or 20%. 20% of 10 is two black marbles where we have an insignificant p-value, even though the uh, intervention is effective. In red here, we have five false positives where the true effect of the intervention is null, but we get a statistically significant finding. How did I calculate that five? Well, remember that there are 90 truly ineffective interventions. And remember that we're testing with alpha equals 0.05. So 90, per, uh, sorry, so 5% of the time when there is no effect, we will mistakenly have a significant um, impact estimate. So 5% of 90 is actually four and a half, but I'm gonna round up to five to make my point. And then the remaining 85 marbles are gray where there is no true effect. And we have a statistically not significant um, p-value one minus alpha of those 90 ineffective interventions. OK, so these are our four buckets. And what the researcher can see is whether there is a statistically significant impact or not. So they can see whether there's no significant p-value, that's black or gray, versus whether there is a statistically significant impact. That's red or green. But they can't tell between the red and green marbles, right? They can't see the true effect if there is statistical significance. And that's a really unfortunate thing because remember of these statistically significant red and green marbles, some of them are true positives, that's green. Some of them are false positives, that's red. Okay, so suppose you as the researcher here have ended up in the happy scenario of having a red or green dot. You have a statistically significant finding from your study, which is usually cause for celebration, you know? And you want to know now, what is the probability that my statistically significant finding is not real, that I have evaluated something with a true effect of zero? Well, to calculate that probability, you can take the number of significant and truly effective, uh, I'm sorry, truly ineffective marbles, those are red, over the total number of statistically significant findings, that's red plus green. So here we see the problem come up we see a 38% chance that when I'm holding a statistically significant finding in my hand, in fact, I've evaluated an intervention with zero effect. So you're testing with alpha equals 0.05. You think like statistical significance is really gonna buy you something, but unfortunately, no. The probability that the impact is a red dot is nearly 40%. This may be obvious, but 38% and 5% are not the same thing. Even though you're testing with this stringent alpha threshold, there is still a really meaningfully large probability that when you get statistical significance, you haven't actually found that silver bullet that moves the needle for your population. Okay, so what does this mean and, and what went wrong here? This, this problem that we've presented is really at the core of the problem that we're trying to solve with BASI. This problem where a small p-value does not imply a high probability that the intervention you're evaluating works. Furthermore, as this example shows, I think, when we nonetheless get excited about a small p-value and shout Eureka, you know, we're not just making a semantic mistake. When we misinterpret p-values, as John showed two slides ago, we're not just making a semantic mistake, we're making a potentially large magnitude mistake. Five and 38 are really different from each other numerically. And one thing that we've really come to appreciate, and also that's reflected in those papers that I showed at the very top of the talk, is that despite this misinterpretation being of really substantive magnitude, it is extremely pervasive, including, I have to admit, like sometimes even for myself, this feeling of eureka when you get a statistically significant impact estimate. I mean, it's, it, it, it happens to us all, I think. Um, but we have to have to have to remember that that feeling really does reflect this misinterpretation where we think a small p-value tells us there's a high probability that the thing we're evaluating works when in fact it doesn't. So throughout the rest of this presentation, you'll hear us comparing BASI against this problem with misinterpretation of p-values. And I just wanna be really clear, this misinterpretation is what we're talking about. This feeling of excitement when we see small p-values, when we think we finally found something that works, that's the misinterpretation we're talking about. 
Um, and just remember that can be a large magnitude mistake. That was the point of this example. So what went wrong here? What went wrong is that an impact estimate is influenced by two different things. First, our impact estimate can be large if we get if we have a large random error. So in the slide John showed that gave the correct definition of a p-value, remember he was saying, you know, we just re-randomize a bunch of times. Sometimes the treatment group happens to have better outcomes than the comparison group. Sometimes the comparison group happens to have outcomes better than the treatment group. Those are the types of random errors we're talking about. The second thing that moves your impact estimate, of course, is how effective your intervention actually is. And therefore, to calculate the probability of a program being genuinely effective, this thing that we actually want to know at the end of our impact evaluation, we need to take both of these pieces into, a cons into consideration. Sorry, We need to know how often do we get big random errors. That's going to be a function primarily of sample size. We'll get a lot of random errors when sample sizes are small. But then in addition, we need this other piece. We need to know how often are programs truly effective? How often are they truly ineffective? So that's the 90 versus 10 of the 100 true effects that we talked about in the example. The problem, what went wrong with the 38 not equal to five is that statistical significance is based only on the first. When you calculate a p-value, you don't incorporate any information about how often programs are effective or not. You only incorporate information on how often random errors are big or small through the standard error, which is driven by sample size. So as I said, in this example that we had on the previous slide, we need that prior information that only 10% of programs are effective in order to be able to calculate that 38% probability. One quick aside, I want to acknowledge that the uh, example that I used was assuming that interventions are either effective, yes, or ineffective, no. And of course, as you guys know, in the real world, programs have this whole range of effects, some of which are small, but not equal to zero. Um, statistical significance testing ignores this. John? Thank you, Mariel. So I'm just going to emphasize once again what this missing link was. The missing link was the prior evidence, the knowledge that 10% of programs truly had meaningful effects. And I'd, I'd like to emphasize that this number we're reporting in the example, that 38% of statistically significant estimates are false discoveries or false positives, that is dependent on that 10% number. This isn't some universal truth. You can't just go around thinking, oh, well, if it's statistically significant at the 5% level, that means 38% of effects uh, are spurious. That's not what it means. It, you, you actually need the specific missing link prior information for your context. And so if, for example, um, half of interventions were effective instead of 10%, so in the example, if it was 50 of the 100 programs were effective, then we actually would have 5% uh, of statistically significant impact estimates being a false discovery. We would have what we thought that we had when we were misinterpreting statistical significance. And on the other hand, if 100% um, of the interventions were effective, then the proportion of statistically significant impact estimates that are false discoveries would be zero. Um, and if none of the interventions were effective, then all of the statistically significant impact estimates would be false discoveries. So we have this nice bounding. Um, when you look at a statistically significant impact estimate, you can know that somewhere between zero and 100% of them are false discoveries. Um, and what we'd like to do is kind of tighten those bounds a little bit so that we, ha we have a more refined understanding of what the probability is that the darn thing works. Um, and to do that, we need uh, that external evidence. So let's go on to the next slide and continue on our journey. Um, now we're gonna move into the components of the framework. We're gonna first, as kind of like a step zero, talk about how we conceptualize probability and priors, uh, because they're often, well, there's a diversity of perspectives on how to interpret probability and priors. And there are some concerns or some worries that people have about 
uh, where do these priors come from and what does probability mean? And we're gonna tell you what, what it means to us with BASI. Uh, then we're gonna go through the different steps of using BASI, selecting the prior evidence, reporting the impact estimate, interpreting the impact estimate and sensitivity analyses. So let's go to the next slide. All right, conceptualizing probability and priors. Next slide, please. So, you know, math is a pretty cool thing. In, in the world of math, math is a completely abstract world and it's defined by rules and definitions. And when you apply those rules and those definitions, you can come up with all sorts of interesting results. But for that math world to be relevant to the real world, we need to tell some stories uh, to connect those mathematical constructs to reality. So just as a real simple example, uh, two plus two equals four, that's a mathematical construct. But to make it useful, we need to interpret uh, that two plus two equals four in the real world. So you could say, suppose you have two apples, your friend gives you two more apples. How many apples do you have? Well, the math helps us to understand that we now have four apples. Um, you could also say something like, well, I have two apples uh, and you give me two oranges. What do I have now? Well, I have four pieces of fruit, you know? So you can kind of uh, play with that interpretation and that conceptualization in order to make it useful for your context. Um, we need a story to connect the mathematical construct of probability uh, to the real world. Uh, and we especially need a story to connect that prior distribution to the real world. What do we really mean by these things? So let's go to the next slide. I'm gonna start off telling uh, what is in scare quotes, a Bayesian probability story. Um, this is the thing that I think a lot of folks fear or worry might be what we mean by uh, Bayesian. And I wanna emphasize that the example I'm giving here is it's an intentionally exaggerated example. We don't mean to suggest that uh, serious Bayesian statisticians would be necessarily looking at it quite like this, but we wanna dispel the concerns about the approach. So here's a, a Bayesian probability story. The term Bayesian probability is sometimes defined as the intensity of one's personal belief regarding the truth of a proposition. Um, it's also conceptualized as, as placing bets. And so a common story, and I'll give you the story along with a made up example. I have a set of prior beliefs. Uh, for example, I think my hometown team is a great team. They, they are just stacked this year. I feel so great about their chances. I'm 99% sure they're gonna win a championship. Okay, I have prior beliefs. Bayesian story continues, I get new information. My hometown team loses the first three games of the season. And so now I'm supposed to update my beliefs. Well, my prior beliefs were really, really strong. Um, I'm very confident in my home team. And so I really still think they're pretty great and they just got unlucky. So after taking into account this new information, I'm gonna update my belief and conclude that there's a 98.5% chance that my home team will win a championship this year. Um, and this is of course an exaggerated example, but I think that it is uh, a trap that one can fall into with less extreme examples. Um, when we incorporate our beliefs about something we're evaluating into the answer to that evaluation question. Um, I know that in many fields, uh, there are advocates for different approaches to doing things and they do have strong beliefs and for good reason about whether their approach works. Um, but from an evaluation perspective, we don't wanna incorporate those beliefs into the answers to research questions. We wanna save beliefs for the asking of research questions. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to Mariel now to tell you what, how we think about probability. Great. So just to emphasize what John said, this is an intentionally exaggerated example of what we think people fear when they hear Bayesian probability. We wanna be very clear now that that is not what we mean. Rather, with Basie, we conceptualize probability in terms of relative frequencies of observable things, or I will acknowledge at least hypothetically observable things. For example, sampling from superpopulations is an example some of you guys might be familiar with. But our story with Basie, with this nice concrete definition of probability, looks different from what John was describing on the last slide. 
With Basie, we have prior evidence, not prior beliefs, but prior evidence about some broad class of things. So for example, maybe sports teams with characteristics similar to my hometown team win championships 20% of the time. That's a relative frequency of observable things. I get new evidence regarding one member of that class. So for example, again, my hometown team loses their first three games. And then I wanna interpret that new evidence that I just got in the context of the prior evidence that I had. And this is what this might look like. Remember, interpretation that I is the I in Basie. So this is really the key step for us. It might look like us saying that teams that started the season looking like my team with similar characteristics, who then went on to lose their first three games, win a championship approximately 1% of the time. And the thing to really emphasize here is that Basie is based on evidence. It's based on statistical models and very clearly stated assumptions about what that evidence is and what those models are doing. Personal beliefs, as John said, regarding the answers to substantive research questions, they do not have anything to do with BC. They, they don't have a role to play in our view. Okay, so how does this work mechanically in a kind of more real world example, this combining of prior evidence with new evidence to get an interpretation? What does that look like? All right, so we have prior evidence in purple. We're gonna bring in new evidence in green and get an interpretation at the end of the day. That's in gray. For folks who have uh, dipped their toes into the Bayesian waters already, purple could be called prior, green could be called likelihood, gray could be called posterior. So the kind of prior evidence we're interested in looks like this. It's a distribution of prior intervention effects. So in this histogram, you can think of you know, the little pixels in the histogram, each being an intervention that's been evaluated in the past. And we could read off of this histogram, for example, as shown with the purple shading, that 16% of interventions have had impacts greater than 0.2 standard deviations. So that's the kind of nice, concrete, countable Bayesian probability that we're interested in. We're gonna combine this with new evidence in the form of what's called a likelihood. And this looks a lot like the histogram John showed when he was defining what a p-value actually means, right? This shows the impact estimates from repeatedly um, doing random assignment for your study. For example, we see here shaded in green that in um, when our impact estimate is 0.2 standard deviations, there's just a 2.5% chance of seeing an estimate this big or bigger conditional in the true effect being zero. So these are the two pieces of the puzzle, right? We need this prior evidence about intervention effects of a class of kind of broadly similar interventions to the one that we're evaluating. That tells us how big can true effects be. And then in the bottom, we need um, information about how big noise can be, how big flukes can be. And that's shown uh, in the histogram in the bottom. We put those two things together using Bayes' rule, which is a simple mathematical um, formula, and we get this interpretation here shown in green. There's a 96% chance that the true effect of this intervention is greater than zero. There's a 33% chance that the true effect is greater than 0.2 standard deviations. And I want to emphasize that these statements shown in gray here, these Basie interpretation statements, those are the interpretations we want. Those are the policy relevant statements that answer our substantive research question. We want to know what is the probability that this thing works. And remember, a p-value doesn't tell us that. When we try to learn that from a p-value, we can be making a large magnitude mistake. OK, so hopefully on the last slide, you have become convinced that we need a prior. We need that top distribution. Now, in this first step of the BASI framework, I want to tell you, how do we get that prior? What does it look like very concretely? So we're really lucky in education research because there is a wealth of really well curated prior evidence from the What Works Clearinghouse. And we use that evidence from the What Works Clearinghouse to build for you guys as part of this work, many different prior intervention, um, I'm sorry, prior distributions that you guys can choose from. 
in particular across seven different outcome domains and five different school levels. We have these 35 different combinations of outcome domain and school levels. Each one has a prior. And then in addition, we put all of the outcome domains and school levels together to give you a, a 36th kind of overall prior. You can choose in each one whether to incorporate an adjustment for the so-called file juror problem, whereby more statistically significant impact estimates are more likely to see the light of day and more likely to be included in the What Works Clearinghouse. We took a data-driven approach to estimating how big of an influence that has in biasing the evidence base. And that, of course, results in this more pessimistic view of prior evidence. It accounts for the fact that what we might be seeing is kind of an over-optimistic view, so it brings that back down into an unbiased range. And then in addition, another choice you get to make is whether to force the prior distribution to be centered at zero impact or to leave it where, uh, where the WWC estimates it to be. And this zero centering is really most appropriate, as I'm sure you can imagine, in a kind of multi-arm trial without a control group. So if instead of comparing a treatment to a placebo control arm, you're comparing treatment A to treatment B, then maybe you're kind of, you don't have any reason to think a priori that the prior should be centered north of zero versus south of zero. And we allow you to center it right dead at zero for that reason. So, this is where the prior distributions are coming from and some choices you get to make. Now I want to switch topics briefly and talk very concretely about how we use this evidence from the Works Clearinghouse to calculate these prior distributions. In particular, we did so using Bayesian meta-regression. And the inputs to those meta-regression models are point estimates, which are, <laughs> it goes without saying, just estimates. We don't see the true impacts in the WWC. We see estimates of those impacts in the WWC. And we account in our meta-regression modeling for two types of errors that these estimates can carry. First, they have standard errors. So smaller studies have bigger standard errors. They're going to carry less weight in our meta-regression. Larger studies have smaller standard errors, and we're going to give them more weight as a result. Also, as I said before, we're going to account optionally. You get to choose for this file drawer problem or not. The meta regression additionally accounts for clustering of findings within studies, because of course those are not independent. And also for potential variation in true impacts across school levels and across outcome domains. Remember, as I said, you can pick a prior for different combinations of school levels and outcome domains. That's reflecting the fact that in reality, it may be easier to move the needle on some outcomes or in some levels than others. And then in addition, our meta regression accounts for the fact that true impacts are not going to follow this nice, clean Gaussian distribution, a normal distribution. Instead, we're going to allow these true impacts to come from what's called a skewed generalized T distribution, which is way more flexible than a normal distribution. And it's going to allow in particular for the possibility of skewness. I mean, maybe hopefully in reality, true intervention effects tend to be favorable tend less often to be unfavorable, and for fat tails as well. OK, so we went to the WWC. We got these estimates of effects from prior studies. We use this meta regression to infer the distribution of true effects, which might be skewed. I'm going to flip the slide and show you what that distribution looks like. So here she is. Each dot in this distribution is a hypothetical intervention from the What Works Clearinghouse restricted to studies that met standards. And the x-axis here shows the true impact of that intervention in effect size units. You can see that 27 out of the 100 interventions in beige had unfavorable effects. And 73 um, are green here. They had favorable effects. And you can see a lot of things here. This figure shows that favorable effects in green are more common than unfavorable effects in beige. It also shows that small effects near zero, near the center of the distribution, are much more common than um, large effects. But it also shows that big favorable effects, so that's the green tail out to the right of the figure, big favorable effects are much more common than big unfavorable effects. We don't see a lot of beige dots way out in the left tail. And I'll just point out that this is the um, 
distribution that applies across all outcomes and school levels. But the uh, distributions that are specific to an outcome school level distribution don't actually look very different. So we don't actually see reflected in the WWC evidence that it's much more easy to move the needle in some schools, school levels or outcomes than others. They look pretty much like this across the board. The prior shown on this slide is adjusted for the for bias due to the file drawer problem. And if we didn't make that adjustment, as I said on the prior slide, this distribution would shift a bit to the right. So in particular, the mean would be 0.23 instead of 0.16, which I'm not sure you can see, but that's the mean of this distribution shown here. And as you can also see here, this is not a zero-centered distribution. Remember, those were the two choices you get to make. Should it be file drawer adjusted and should it be zero-centered? This one is adjusted for the file drawer problem. It is not centered at zero. Instead, it has a mean, as I was saying, of 0.16, a median of 0.11. Okay, so the goal of this slide was really to make it as crude as po possible what we mean when we say that you need prior evidence. This is what you need. And that was step one of BC. I'm going to give it to John now to talk about step two. All righty, thank you, Mario. Um, so, step two, we're going to just talk about reporting the impact estimate, which is to say the point estimate. Let's go to the next slide. So, we recommend reporting two types of estimates. Uh, the first estimate based only on study data is the estimate that I think everybody's used to reporting. It's, it's just uh, your raw difference in means between the treatment and control group, or maybe a regression adjusted difference in means between the treatment and control group. And we think it's important to report that traditional estimate that we've always reported uh, to be transparent about what is observed in the study data unaffected by the prior distribution. So what is the contribution of the data that you collected in this study? What did we learn specific to this study? That's important to report. Um, and it's also important to report in order to facilitate future meta-analyses. Uh, there's a quip from Andrew Gelman several years ago that all Bayesians want everyone else to be a frequentist. And what he meant by that, he didn't mean that literally. He meant that, that in the context of meta-analyses, analysis, you want to see those uh, raw or regression adjusted non Bayesian impact estimates, because that's reflecting what the data say in each individual study. And then the Bayesian meta regression analyst will combine those things using the Bayesian meta regression model. So for transparency and to facilitate future meta analyses, it's really important to report that traditional estimate. But we also think it's important to report what we can call the Bayesian estimate, which is sometimes called the shrunken estimate. And this is really the, the mean of the posterior distribution, which is kind of sort of a precision weighted average of the traditional estimate and the prior distribution. And we think it's important to report this because it is less susceptible to statistical noise, um, especially in smaller studies. So this represents our best estimate of the effect of the intervention, including both data in the study and everything that we knew from before the study. So we think that both of these are really important to report. Um, but of course, we need to usually lead with a single estimate for clarity and simplicity in reporting. So it's fine to give one greater emphasis and sort of put the other one in, a, in an appendix or, or sensitivity analysis. We just recommend that you pre-specify which estimate you're gonna emphasize before seeing the findings. So you don't wanna say, oh, well, I like mm -hmm. the data only estimate, so I'm gonna emphasize that, or I like the shrunken estimate, so I'm gonna use that. Just pre-specify which one you're going to emphasize, but we do re recommend uh, reporting both. Um, and so now I'm going to, uh, turn it back to Mariel to talk about interpretation. Thanks, John. So again, the I and Basie is for interpretation. This is really the meat of the matter in our opinion. And recall from my use case scenarios at the very beginning, you've got this impact estimate like John was just describing, and you're wondering what to make of it. Have I found an intervention that really moves the needle? That's what we mean by interpretation. So regardless of, from the previous slide, you, whether you choose to emphasize the traditional data only estimate or the Bayesian trunk estimate, we feel strongly that posterior probabilities 
are the best way to interpret findings. We want to be clear that they have a very precise meaning. As John sometimes says, we don't want to like replace misinterpretation of statistical significance with misinterpretation of Bayesian posterior probabilities. So we want to be very clear about what they mean and what they don't. Rule one, Bayesian posterior probabilities apply to the effect of the evaluated intervention on the sample included in your study. That implies that they are not statements about the chances of the intervention having an effect in the future. So these are retrospective past tense in sample probabilities. They are not predictive future tense probabilities. And in a very important thing about these probabilities is that you can only calculate them with prior evidence as we've been emphasizing. And it's therefore very important that when we interpret these posterior probability statements, we do so in the context of the prior that we used. So we want folks to know we're you using prior evidence specific to a one grade level, or did you use that prior that combines evidence across all grade levels, for example? So these are some best practices uh, for using these probability statements. I wanna give a very concrete example of what that looks like on the next slide. So we could say after using BASI, we estimate a 75% probability that our intervention increased reading test scores by at least 0.15 standard deviations. That's given our estimates from this study and given prior evidence on the impacts of reading programs for elementary school students. So this is a single sentence, but it's really doing a lot of work for us. One thing to note is that this is a past tense statement. Our intervention increased reading test scores. Another thing that's really important to notice is that we have baked the prior into this interpretive Bayesian posterior probability statement. That green text is telling folks right on the tin what is the prior evidence that we use to interpret this impact estimate that we have in red in order to get our blue Bayesian posterior probability. Okay, so these are best practices on the slides for stating a, a, a probability statement, excuse me. But a common question that John and I often get is, you know, now that we're going to not no longer use this bright line with P equals 0.05 determining success versus failure, how can we in this brave new world figure out how big a probability is big? So to that end, we want to present some potentially helpful cutoffs and characterizations for these probability statements. We think that focusing on probabilities that exceed some cutoff can be a useful tool. And we think also that the kind of plain language characterizations shown in the right hand slide, uh, sorry, right hand side of this table um, can make findings more accessible. So I won't read through the entire table, but if you look at the very bottom row, for example, you can see that a probability between 95 and 100% could be characterized in nice plain language, for example, as being extremely sure to have occurred. John? Thank you, Mario. Um, so one thing that I'd point out about that uh, previous slide is that there were multiple probabilities reported with the different characterizations. And I want to continue that thread by emphasizing the importance to provide a complete picture of uh, the likelihood that an intervention had uh, a favorable effect. So let's work through this idea with an example. So in this example, we've got two programs that we evaluated as part of our uh, evaluation, program A and program B, and the impact estimate based only on the study data, so this is a traditional estimate, for both programs is an impact estimate of 0.10. The standard errors are pretty different. Program A has a standard error of 0.05, program B 0.2. Suppose that we're interested in calculating the probability that the true effect is of a meaningful magnitude, and in this case we're going to say that a meaningful magnitude is greater than 0.15 standard deviations. Looking just at that probability, it looks like program B did better. There's a 28% chance that there was at least a 0.15 standard deviation improvement in outcomes for program B, whereas it's just a 14% chance for program A. So if we focus on just that one number, program B might appear better than program A. Let's go to the next slide. 
But what if we do more than focus on one number? What if we try to understand a, a more complete picture of the distribution of effects? But let's say that in addition to wanting to have a meaningful effect, we also wanna make sure that we're doing no harm. So it's, it would be a problem if, if it's really likely that we're doing harm. So which of these interventions is less likely to do harm? Well, program A has just a 3% chance of having done some degree of harm, whereas program B has a 34% chance of having done harm. So if we're looking just at the probability of a meaningful effect, program B looks better, but if we're worried about avoiding the potential for harm, program A looks better. So what's going on here? Well, let's look at the next slide and see if we can unpack this a bit further. So I kind of glossed over it when I was initially describing the slide, but the standard error for program B is quite a bit larger than the standard error for program A, which means there's just a lot more uncertainty about the effect of program B. And so what we could do to encapsulate that uncertainty and communicate that more succinctly is to use what's called a credible interval, which is a Bayesian analog of a confidence interval. And we could look at, for example, at the width of the 90% credible interval. Uh, for program A, that credible interval width is just 0.08 standard deviations. But for program B, it's 0.26 standard deviations, which just indicates that there's a lot more uncertainty about the effect of program B. Um, and the interpretation of a credible interval, by the way, is if you have a credible interval of a certain width or a certain fixed upper and lower bound, 90% chance that the true effect lies within that bound. That's what a credible interval means. So uh, let's go on to the next slide. Hand it back to you, Mariel. Thanks, John. Super, so step four in a BASI analysis is to conduct sensitivity analysis. In particular, to look at how sensitive our interpretation is to the prior distribution that we showed. The way to do this, as I'm sure you can imagine, is to calculate these posterior probabilities. For example, there's a 74% chance that the intervention improved outcomes by at least 0.2 standard deviations or what have you. To calculate that type of probability statement, for multiple pre-specified prior distributions. There are two that we suggest that you always include. First, we recommend that you use the zero-centered prior that does have a correction for the potential of file drawer bias, and that incorporates all of the evidence across grade levels and outcomes that meet standards in the WWC. That, the first one I should say is kind of this baseline prior that we think is kind of the most robust and sturdy possible. The second thing to do is to assess sensitivity to making this adjustment for small study effects or file drawer bias um, effects. And then in addition to these two that we think you should always run, there are additional sensitivity analyses that you might be interested in that would be context specific. So example, if um, a study sample that you're if I, sorry, if you are conducting a study and the sample from that study includes both elementary and middle school students, then we'd be interested. Is there sensitivity to whether you use the prior distribution that pertains to elementary school students versus if you use the prior that's based on evidence on middle school student effects? So that kind of context specific sensitivity analysis is also of interest. So these are kind of post hoc sensitivity analyses kind of in the standard uh, genre that you might be familiar with from, from standard sensitivity analysis. But one thing that's kind of uh, specific to Bayesian sensitivity analysis is that it really doesn't have to be post hoc like this. In particular, we can think about sensitivity to choosing a prior distribution when we're still at the design stage of our study. The reason is that more precise impact estimates, so that's impact estimates with smaller standard errors based on a larger sample size, those are going to be less sensitive to which prior distribution you use. So the, the more precise your impact estimate is, the more weight your data is going to carry in the analysis compared to this prior evidence that you're bringing in, and therefore the less sensitive you're going to be to what that prior evidence looks like. And what this means is that sensitivity to the prior can be part of your power analysis when you're designing the study. You can 
power. You can choose your sample size for your study in order to restrict the amount of sensitivity to the prior you're going to have at the end of the day. Okay, so this concludes our rather theoretical description of all of the components of the BASI framework. We want to now get nice and practical, and I'm going to give it uh, to John for that purpose. All right, thank you, Meryl. So we have, you go on to the next slide. Um, we have created a spreadsheet tool that folks can use to calculate these interpretive probabilities and also credible intervals uh, just in the spreadsheet tool. And you don't even, it doesn't even involve like Visual Basic or anything like that. So there's no IT department constraints on downloading this thing. Um, anybody can download it and use it to interpret their traditional impact estimates. What you will need to do is you'll input your impact estimate, the standard error for that estimate, and the degrees of freedom for that estimate. Uh, by degrees of freedom, I just mean the degrees of freedom that your statistical program likely spits out anyway, but uh, more specifically, it tends to be uh, something like the number of units randomized minus the number of covariates in the model at the level of randomization minus one. So n minus k minus one. That's just all I mean by degrees of freedom. So you input those things, the sort of standard things that come out of uh, studies typically. Then you select which prior distribution you want to use. As Mariel indicated earlier, there are 108 different prior distributions that we have prefabricated for you and they are included in the spreadsheet tool. You select which one you want to use. And then you can also specify uh, posterior probabilities and credible intervals of interest, but there are also several um, pre-specified posterior probabilities and credible intervals that you can look at and, and you can specify your own. I should, spec I should uh, clarify that all of this needs to be in effect size units. Um, so you need to convert everything, these impact estimate standard errors into effect size units, and then the posterior statements will be with respect to effect sizes. You don't have to stick with effect sizes. When you actually go to write up your findings, you can convert them back into uh, natural units. You can convert them into, you know, weeks of instruction. You can use whatever interpretive metric you want, but for the purposes of the spreadsheet, they need to be expressed in effect size units. Um, so on the next slide, I'm going to describe an example of using the tool. I'm going to first walk through this slide in the example, and then I'm going to attempt to uh, take control of the screen for Mariel and share a spreadsheet um, and uh, walk through this example in the spreadsheet. But let's just start off with the slide here. So in this hypothetical example, I'm imagining that a school district conducts a small evaluation in which they're gonna compare two middle school math curricula. And the idea is that they want this uh, evaluation they're conducting in their school district to inform their choice of middle school math curricula for their district. So the decision rule that they have is that if there is at least a 70% chance that one curriculum leads to higher over test scores, higher, higher test scores than the other, then that's the one they're going to adopt. Um, but if findings from the evaluation don't cross that level of confidence, then they're going to bring in other factors to determine uh, which curriculum is, is selected. It'll just be a vote of the curriculum committee and people on the curriculum committee can bring in their professional judgment, other considerations. So they have decided in my example that 70% is the threshold of confidence that they want in order to let the evaluation make the decision essentially. So the study findings comparing impact estimate A versus B, we get a 0.10 standard deviation difference between curriculum A and B. Uh, the standard error, is 0.15 standard deviations and the degrees of freedom is 98. Uh, the prior distribution, well, they're gonna select middle school, they're gonna select math outcomes, and they're gonna select a zero centered prior distribution because in this case, they are comparing two treatments to each other. They're not comparing a treatment to a baseline or a business as usual comparison condition. So 
there's no way, essentially it's not clear what's treatment and control. They're, they're exchangeable to use a methodological term. And so we're gonna use a zero centered prior. And then we will have the Basie interpretation, which as you will see, it's gonna turn out that there's a 71% chance that test scores were higher under curriculum A. And because that just barely crosses their threshold, uh, they're gonna go ahead and adopt curriculum A. So now we're gonna try to see if I can share my screen. So Mariel, can you see uh, that spreadsheet? That's beautiful. Alrighty then. Um, so I'm going to just point out some features of the spreadsheet. Um, I have sort of pre-entered a lot of the, uh, the information here, but I'll, I'm gonna try to orient you to this spreadsheet. So in this spreadsheet, on the left are things that we are inputting um, that's where the um, impact estimates here from rows seven through 10 are gonna be input. We're inputting the prior distribution, rows one through four. Um, and then it reports, what are the prior probabilities from this prior distribution? And so it's gonna tell us just based on the prior distribution, you know, what fraction of impacts are greater than zero, for example. And because it's a zero centered prior, it's 50%. Um, and then we could say, well, what fraction of impacts are bigger than say 0.10 standard deviations down at row 31 and 35% are bigger than 0.10. So that's, that's what the prior distribution is before we take into account the findings from the study. And then over on the right-hand side, uh, we have the output, the posterior distribution. Um, we have credible intervals up at the top, um, and then we have specific posterior probabilities that might be of interest uh, in the lower right-hand part of the spreadsheet, which I'll highlight. We also have the mean and the standard deviation of the posterior distribution. The mean of the posterior distribution is the shrunken estimate, or what we call the Bayesian estimate, um, one of the two-point estimates that we recommend reporting. So to use this uh, tool, you come up here to the top and first you're going to pick which model you want to use. So the main model um, would be where we include an adjustment for um, potential bias due to the file drawer problem and it is not zero centered. That's the main model. Mirrored means that we basically mirror the data so that we flip treatment and control and control and treatment that means it's gonna be zero centered, but we still include the adjustment for um, bias due to the file drawer problem. And then finally, we have this third option, which would be sort of the most optimistic regarding uh, favorable effects of interventions. And that is to have no small study effect or no file drawer effect uh, adjustment. And um, it's not zero centered, but for, for this, we're going with uh, mirrored. And then we can choose the school level. Uh, we can pop up that menu and we can see we can choose all pre-K, elementary, middle, high school, post-secondary. We're choosing middle because that's what this school district is focused on. And then you can also see over here math achievement. Um, and there are, are a variety of outcome domains. We've got ELA, science, other achievement, behavioral attainment, and uh, mystery meet, miscellaneous. Um, we describe in the uh, guide from IES exactly what goes in to all of these different outcome domains. Um, down here, we're gonna input our traditional impact estimate. And as I said before, the impact estimate that our hypothetical school district got here was 0.10 standard deviations. They had a standard error of 0.15 and 98 degrees of freedom. Um, and then right here is a, uh, kind of techie box here where we have to control our simulation precision. And so with that, I will just say a brief word about what is going on under the hood with this spreadsheet. Uh, so folks familiar with Bayesian analysis might know that uh, the modern way to do Bayesian analysis is to use something called Markov Chain Monte Carlo. Uh, and there's a wonderful program called STAN uh, programming language really, 
which uh, provides a, a really powerful and um, robust way to do that type of analysis. But that, as great as that program is, and as, as big an advance as it is relative to what came before, it still requires you to learn an entirely new programming language. It also requires you to install a C compiler on your computer and know how to configure it. Um, and so it's kind of a, a big hurdle. And so we didn't want folks to have to do that. Um, but we can't implement Markov chain Monte Carlo in an Excel spreadsheet. So what we do is we use what uh, you might call a brute force Monte Carlo uh, estimation approach, which we describe in the guide. And we have validated against Stan. Um, so all of the probabilities reported here, they're gonna be uh, valid probabilities, but the precision of the probabilities because it's Monte Carlo is gonna be something we have to pick. Um, and because it's Excel rather than a C compiler, it's gonna be kind of slow. Um, so we have three options. One is low precision, which is what I'm operating at here. Um, we have a high precision, which I'm not gonna select because it would take too long to recalculate the spreadsheet. Um, and then we have one that's called minimum file size, which literally means pick this only for the purposes of making the Excel spreadsheet as small as possible. For example, if you wanna email it to a colleague, but don't use minimum file size to actually calculate anything. Um, so that's a little bit of a long-winded description of a kind of boring issue, but that's uh, how you control the statistical precision of these calculations. If you're just kind of messing around, I would recommend low precision, but if you're looking to like put this in a report or to a journal article, then you're gonna wanna use high precision. Um, so that is the spreadsheet tool. I'm going to stop sharing um, and re hopefully Mariel can take it back. There we go. Um, so now I'm going to continue to a second example, but I won't go through the whole spreadsheet tool thing again. I'll just point out how you could uh, use the tool for a somewhat different use case. So in, in the second example, we are going to imagine that a school district conducts a small evaluation of a very expensive science tutoring program for high school students at risk of missing a graduation requirement. So this isn't treatment versus treatment, it's treatment versus business as usual, and it's an expensive um, treatment. The district's decision rule, if there is at least a 50% chance, so you know more likely than not, that the program boosts test scores by at least 0.2 standard deviations, it will, they will adopt the program. So I just wanna pause here, and I wanna point out that these cutoffs that we are looking at on this example and the previous one, it's not P less than 0.05, which is completely arbitrary and disconnected from the substance of the decision being made. Instead, we're focusing on cutoffs that are relevant to the discussion decision being made. And at least hypothetically, I'm imagining that these cutoffs are being uh, determined in consultation with the decision makers. So assessing, what is, what's meaningful for them? What are they trying to achieve? And what level of confidence is acceptable for them? Um, so that's just a very different way of using results from a statistical analysis to make a decision. P less than 0.05, completely disconnected from the reality of a decision. Just wanna kind of emphasize that. Anyway, continuing with the example. Um, the district decision rule, as I said, there's at least a 50% chance of program boost test scores by at least 0.2 standard deviations. They're going to adopt it. Um, study findings, the impact estimate, 0.23 standard deviations. Standard error, 0.10 standard deviations, degree of freedom, 198. So you would input those things into the spreadsheet. Then prior distribution, well, we'll select high school uh, from the school level. We'll select science outcomes from the pop-up menu for uh, outcome domain. And we're gonna go ahead and adjust for those small study effects. So it's gonna be the main model, uh, but it's not zero centered. Um, and then we get um, the, uh, the um, posterior mean is 0.18. The um, median is 0.14, or, or I'm sorry, the... <laughs> Um, sorry, the, uh, the I'm that's the distribute that's the characteristics of the prior distribution. 
And then finally, the Bayesian interpretation, which is generated by the spreadsheet, is that there's a 54% chance that test scores rose by at least 0.2 standard deviations. And so the decision is to implement the tutoring program throughout the district. Could have gone the other way if, if the standard error were different or the impact estimate were a little different, it could have come under 50% and the, the district might have made a different decision. So we can go to the next slide. Super, so hopefully we've made it nice and concrete for you what this would look like in terms of implementing it in your context. We now wanna take a step back and summarize some kind of key messages. So for anybody who understandably may have not provided 100% focus, this is a good time to just tune back in for a little moment. We'll be brief here. We, and you using the base C framework, can answer the question, what is the probability that the intervention I'm evaluating had a meaningful effect. We can do this based on hard, cold evidence, not squishy personal belief. And importantly, we can do this without misinterpreting key values or statistical significance. This is important to answer that question with p-values, to try to answer that question in the first bullet with p-values requires misinterpreting p-values. P-values cannot provide an answer to the question about what's the probability this thing works. You need prior evidence to do that. Remember, you have to bring in both the evidence about true effects and you need to know how big flukes tend to be as well. It's really only by putting those two things together with BASI that you can answer this important question. Sensitivity to what prior evidence you choose is gonna be lower when you have a bigger study with more precisely estimated impacts. And as John showed, um, using this spreadsheet tool, we can, you can choose among a number of pre-baked priors and easily apply this approach in your own study or when interpreting on your own evidence from the literature. Thanks, Mariel. We also thought it might be uh, interesting to point out what some potential future directions could be for BASI. These are things that we don't necessarily have to do. Other folks could do them, or if folks are interested in particular items here, we'd love to hear uh, your feedback, if, if that's something that really resonates with you. Um, so some potential future directions that uh, that occur to us is we could continue to enhance this meta-regression analysis. For example, there will continue to be new findings added to the What Works Clearinghouse, and we could add new findings or new studies to these prior distributions. Um, another potential avenue of research would be to look at relationships between program impacts and the components of those programs in a meta-analysis context. Um, we could also try to estimate variation in program effects by student subgroups. If uh, this type of information is systematically recorded, it becomes possible to do that. So that's the type of thing that could be added to BASI in the future. Another possible enhancement to the probability tool would be to add the ability to jointly interpret multiple impact estimates from a study. Uh, in the examples we were looking at, we were looking really primarily at interpreting one estimate at a time, but there's, if you have multiple impact estimates from a study, then the study's providing more information and there would be benefit to interpreting those jointly, which would be potentially a useful add-on. Um, and some folks have suggested replacing or complementing the spreadsheet tool with an R-Shiny app, which could provide more functionality. Um, and we're certainly open to that possibility if folks are interested. Um, and then further down the road, um, where we would ultimately like to go uh, is quite compatible with where we started in this presentation when Matt was talking about SEER principles. He was including generalizing, which include generalizing and scaling. And so uh, ultimately, I think it would be really uh, helpful if we could go beyond answering the question, what is the probability the intervention worked, which is certainly a very important question. It's what we thought we were getting with p-values, but we weren't. And so it's a step forward to actually be able to estimate that or answer that question. But it would also be valuable to answer the question, what is the probability the intervention will work in your context? And that would be a great uh, step forward that we think will eventually be possible with this approach. So those are potential future directions. And now I'm gonna hand it back to Lauren. Thanks, 
Lauren, I'm not sure if you're on mute. We can't hear you. Lauren, you seem to still be on mute. Wow. So my headset muted me. And then when I unmuted that, then the other thing unmuted. Anyway, can you all hear me now? <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, so thank you to Mariel and John. Um, this was a great presentation. Um, before we do some q and um, I, ju I just wanted to mention a few things. Um, one is uh, I, I posted in the chat the link to um, not only the guide, but also the spreadsheet tool and, and um, R and Stan code. Um, so you can find that all there. Um, and I also want to to mention that there are a couple of other guides uh, that we that we produced that Matt was talking about earlier. Um, if you go to the um, SEER uh, web web page, the SEER principles, and you you can find lots of great resources that we worked on, as well as other other um, really good resources. So before we, I just wanted to put that out there. Um, and then I also want to talk here about um, some additional supports that we are providing. So there's an opportunity for individualized consultation. So this is uh, assumes that you've uh, participated in this webinar, or you've read the guide, and you're actually working on something where you want to um, use Bayesi and and um, you just need a little bit of advice and thought about how to how to best do that. Um, so you will be receiving an email um, uh, with, uh, with a link to a form where, that you can fill out. And then um, one of the uh, authors of the guide will review. And if they think that it's something that they could be helpful to, 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 be, to have a conversation, um, then um, they'll reach out and they can work with you um, to help think through the issues that you that you have. Um, if it's if it's an issue that is easily, um, she, they can point to a, a place in the guide and they, they might just simply say that. Um, but we just wanted to uh, um, let you know that this opportunity uh, will be available and you'll receive an email about that. So, um, so that's, I think it, you can go to the next slide. Um, see if there are any questions. I know there were a few early questions about the recording. That will be, uh, the link will be emailed to you likely within the week. Um, and then you'll get another email about the consultations. So you should, can be on the lookout for that. Um, and then there were more, some, a couple of substantive questions. Um, Rachel Johns asked, um, are there particular parameters or recommendations for selecting program slash studies to include in the priors, like size of the program or common measures, or just intent to impact similar outcomes? So I don't know, John or Mario, if you wanted to take that. I'll take a first shot at that. So um, I'll give a little more uh, description about what's included in, in the priors. So we are using all evidence in the what works clearinghouse that meets evidence standards so that's a, in some ways a pretty broad net um, but in other ways there are some important filters so uh, meeting what works clearinghouse standards means that um, you either need to be a rct uh, that was well conducted um, or you need to be a QED, a quasi-experimental design, match comparison group design, where you meet some um, baseline equivalent standards, among other things. Um, but that's the, the main selection criteria, is that it needs to be a study that was reviewed by the What Works Clearinghouse and that met evidence standards, either with or without reservations, for folks who know uh, what that term means. Now, um, it is certainly possible and uh, could be desirable to go beyond what we did in analyzing uh, findings from the What Works Clearinghouse and to include literature that is specific to your study or what you're interested in that maybe was not included in the clearinghouse or maybe wasn't included at the time that we did our meta-analysis because of course the What Works Clearinghouse is not a static thing. It continues to add new findings. And so you could certainly um, add more uh, evidence to that research base and do your own meta regression analysis. And we have uh, an approach to doing the meta regression analysis that we include in the guide. The guide is divided into what we call an express, which is for folks who are really just focused on applying BASI using the spreadsheet tool and the prior distributions that we provide. 
We then have what we call local stops. So kind of using a train or subway metaphor where you can go deeper into the methodology. And it's in those local stops where we provide suggestions for how to incorporate more evidence into the meta regression model. And we provide um, the mathematics of that meta regression model. We also provide um, STAN and R code in addition to the spreadsheet tool. So folks who are comfortable using those tools and wanna go beyond what we've done, you can do that. So that's, I, th I think there's a kind of series of, there was a conversation or a series of questions. I don't know if you've looked at the chat um, around uh, using an R package and other um, yeah, I, I see. scan and if you wanted to address I, I, yeah, any of that. I, sure, I see Betsy asks, Betsy Wolf asks, doesn't it work in an R package now? Yes, there are. So if, if you uh, are, are comfortable with R, we have R programs that can implement the same algorithms that are in the spreadsheet tool. We also provide the STAN programs that implement our meta regression analysis. Um, so we provide a lot in 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 that way. And I see that uh, um, uh, some folks are talking about you know installing the uh, uh, C compiler and stuff, and the degrees to which that is easy or not. You know, I. I find from talking to some of my colleagues at Mathematica, for some people installing a C compiler is considered easy peasy. And why would anybody ever find that to be a hurdle? Whereas other folks here install C compiler and they just, you know, figuratively speaking, get up and walk out of the room. So, um, you know, choose your own adventure, I would say, with respect to uh, C compilers versus Excel tools. We provide, uh, a range of options for folks. I'll just chime in there real quick, John, and mention that the only reason you need Stan is, as John was saying, if you want to bring in new prior evidence, fit a new meta regression, have your own custom prior that we don't already provide. Otherwise, you can just use the Excel or the R. Then I'll add, if you do want to run your own meta regression to develop your own prior, I think downloading the C compiler and installing that properly within the R framework is going to be the least of your worries. What's much harder is learning this whole new programming language, STAN, which requires the C compiler, um, which really requires a pretty deep understanding of how meta regressions in the Bayesian framework are specified under the hood. And it requires picking priors for a lot of very deeply buried hyperparameters in the model. So we give an example of what that looks like in our STAN code, but I think Customizing that and tweaking that would be um, definitely for somebody who's never used Stan, quite a quite a learning adventure. <laughs> Let's see. I, I think I see another question in here. Um, uh, Michael Rook is asking two questions. He said, "Is it not important to consider measurement differences in collecting outcome domain constructs when combining their effect sizes?" And two, would the combination of subdomains into one large domain have an impact if some of those subdomains have extremely high impact effects while others have zero or negative? So those are great questions. And I'll take a first stab and then hand it over to Mariel to see if she has some thoughts. Um, I think what this question is really getting at is a concept that's known methodologically as exchangeability. And the idea is that uh, Michael was saying, hey, I have reason to believe that some groups of effects are systematically different than other groups of effects. And I would like to take that into account. And I think that that is a great instinct and a great thing to do if you have the ability to do it. So if, if you have a set of uh, findings where there's a consistent coding of the various factors that you think might influence um, the level or the dispersion of effects, then you can include those factors in our meta regression analysis and take them into account. And then you'll find out whether they matter or whether they don't matter. Um, there are a lot of different factors that in our minds, and, and those are great examples that Michael provides, we think could potentially uh, influence you know, the, the level or the dispersion of program effects. Um, but they're not all easily available in the WhatWorks Clearinghouse. And so, uh, or, or we didn't have the ability given 
constraints of time and budget to fully incorporate everything. So um, what that means is there's a broad mix of effects in these prior distributions. And one of the advantages of using that skewed generalized T distribution is its flexibility in incorporating that broad mix. Um, so, you know, it's a good thing to do to in it, include that kind of stuff if it's feasible. If it's not feasible though, it's fine. Um, you just have to understand the population of effects that we're using to interpret the findings. Um, so some of those, you know, when, when we look at that, when Mariel showed the uh, density of effects from the clearinghouse, she showed that distribution that was skewed to the right uh, with some, you know, big effects out in the tail. Well, those may, very well may be some of those subdomains that Michael's referring to where it's easier to move the needle. You know, um, the example that I kind of have in my head is proximal versus distal outcomes. Some outcome measures are very proximal to an intervention, and it's really easier to move the needle on those proximal measures than on the more distal measures. Like a, you know, a state test score might be a distal measure, um, whereas like a developer, uh, de you know, the, the person who made the intervention uh, may have developed a measure that's super proximal, and so it's easier to move that one. Um, so those are mixed in there together, um, and that may be a reason why we see that big skew to the right. Um, so, <laughs> so yes, it's a good issue, and as you know, more metadata is available to take it into account. It'll be a good thing to take into account. Mariel, do you have any additional thoughts there? No, that sounds great. But I did get a chance to read while you were talking the next question that came in. Could I? Uh... Oh, great. Pose it sure. for the group. Um, so David Rinskoff, hi David, uh, suggested that we let people specify what magnitude of an effect might be considered negligible. Like for example, maybe between point, negative 0.15 and positive 0.15 standard deviations. And then report using BASI, what's the probability that there's an unfavorable versus negligible versus favorable impact. Some people call that negligible region a region of practical equivalence. It's like practically, a zero effect. Um, so John, I'm actually forgetting if that is something that comes out of the spreadsheet tool already or if it would be easy to tweak. Well, why don't I just um, go ahead and share that uh, spreadsheet tool again? All yours. It's <laughs> um, a great question, David. So let's go. Can you see that, Mariel? Is that uh, yeah, visible? Yeah, that looks great. OK, so I believe that we can piece together what David's asking for. So for up here in uh, columns E through G and rows one through four, we have credible intervals uh, that the user can specify. You can specify what you want the lower and upper bound of these credible intervals to be. So for example, here I said zero and uh, 0.4, I could do minus 0 0.05 and I hit tab and it recalculates and then I type 0 0.05. Um, I try to 0 0.05, I hit tab and it recalculates. And so now that's showing the, prob the posterior probability that the impact falls between minus 0.05 standard deviations and 0.05 standard deviations. So if you wanna define that as your region of, um, you know, Sorry. Practical <laughs> equivalence. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The region of practical equivalence. You can do that. Or you can specify minus 0.10 to 0.10 or whatever you want. Um, it doesn't have to be centered around zero. It can be whatever credible interval you want. You can specify it here. And then um, you can combine that with specific posterior probabilities down here uh, to, I believe, get at what David was asking for. And all of these all of these green cells are things you can change. So we have some, you know, preset numbers, but you can go in and change those green cells to be whatever you would like them to be. Thank you very much. That's that's great. I, I appreciate it. And Mariel, thank you for you and your colleagues for contributing to the special issue on Bayesian stat of evaluation review. So, thank you, um, David. thanks. So we, we are actually at time. We, I know there's two more kind of sets of questions in the chat. Um, maybe we can just, if people want to stay a little bit longer, we can do those last few questions. Otherwise, uh, as I mentioned, consultations, if you want to reach out um, on that, uh, 
uh, for more consultations. And we encourage you to review the guide, um, whether you want to do the express or the local stops. So thanks. Um, so Mary Ellen and John, do you have time for a few more questions? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm happy okay. to stay. Uh, let's see. So let's say I'm just looking at them now. Um, Read us the first one. So somebody sure. asks how receptive collaborators have been when we propose using Bayesian methods instead of traditional key values. Have there been challenges to persuading non-statisticians to adopt this perspective? How have we overcome them? So that's one question. And then a second one from the same person. Under the hood, how deep does BASI go with regards to hyperparameters or is it dependent on adequate? Is it dependent on or adaptable to the problem at hand? Sorry about that. So I could speak to the first one. Um, I have quite a lot of experience working with collaborators, often non-statisticians, very applied practical researchers who have been dyed in the wool p-value users for their entire research career. And I think that even for these folks for whom Bayesian methods are brand new and maybe a little scary, and maybe they have that Bayesian probability story in their head. Um, I'm forgetting which one of us told that. I think it was you, John, about how Bayesian probability is really subjective and squishy and about personal beliefs. So maybe for a number of reasons, familiarity with p-values, distrust of Bayesian probabilities, they really aren't kind of initially thinking that this would be a way to go. I think even for that group of folks, um, Oftentimes, there is some level of awareness that p-values have problems. And I think, you know, through, through discussion about those problems, I think a, a door really opens where it becomes clear for folks that they need something else in order to interpret their impact estimates, that p-values aren't giving them what they have always thought that p-values could give you. Um, and then ho hopefully, once we open that door, I think that this, this BASI framework really does provide a pretty, a pretty nice kind of filler for that hole that's been left. John, what do you think? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I can add to that because, you know, I'm one of those colleagues that Mariel <laughs> convinced was that this was a good idea. So uh, I was trained in back in the 90s, you know, the last century um, as an economist, uh, and I knew almost nothing about Bayesian methods. What I learned about Bayesian methods was, well, gee, it's really neat because you get these probability statements about uh, what you're interested in, but you have to use these priors and where the heck do they come from? And they're defined in terms of personal belief. Um, and, oh, you have to assume everything's normal. Um, so it's like there, there, it, there were multiple things that just, at least to me, seemed very unappealing. And one of the big things, the biggest thing for me really was this um, realization that you don't have to conceptualize uh, probability and priors in terms of the intensity of your personal belief, because as an evaluator, that's pretty hard to swallow. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that, uh, uh, you know, we, we were talking about um, Bayesian methods at a OPRE methods meeting several years ago, and uh, Naomi Goldstein, who is retired now, but she was head of OPRE, and um, she had a some great comments in the summation of that meeting where she acknowledged, you know, I understand that statistical significance is problematic, but um, I've always conceptualized my job, I'm now speaking for Naomi, um, as an evaluator, as, you know, it's, it's the job of the policymakers to ask the questions, and then it's my job to look at the data and give them answers. And so the idea of taking the policymaker, the decision makers, beliefs regarding the effects of the intervention that they came up with and that they're funding and regurgitating that belief back to them is very unappealing. Um, and so we shared that concern and, and that's a big part of the motivation here. Um, so I, at least for me, that was a huge issue, a huge conceptual issue. Um, I would say, um, moving beyond myself, I found that some folks are really receptive to this. And I think the closer they are to uh, decision making, the more receptive they tend to be. I think that um, sort of evaluators who uh, are not as close to decision making and sort of have a way of doing things uh, can be less open to it. Um, but, um, you know, I think the ASA statement sure does help. And I think um, this beliefs versus evidence thing helps. Uh, but really, I haven't found a lot of strong resistance. It happens occasionally, but it's it's pretty rare, I would say. So I think the 
the um, the last comment was it wasn't really a, uh, it was more a comment than a question, which was that uh, that that this is a great tool potentially beyond the world of education as well. And um, I agree. <laughs> um, um, but you know, listening to you all uh, talk uh, just earlier today, uh, earlier during the presentation, I thought about about 20 years ago before the What Works Clearinghouse and um, the fact that we didn't have that information easily at hand. And, mm -hmm. you know, it just makes me really thankful and that that we now have that information and and not just in education and other fields as well. And there's so much um, good research being done. So I applaud everyone who's doing the research um, and applaud the people who are trying to um, compile all that research um, to help us all um, do what we need to do to help support people who are implementing programs. Um, so anyway, with that, I'll get off the soapbox and um, I will say thank you. Thank you to the, the 40 some odd people who stuck it out the whole time, <laughs> as well as everyone who attended. And, um, and uh, again, uh, please uh, review the guide and, um, and um, you'll get the recording. And then if you would like consultations, we're more than happy to um, talk to you about this a little bit more. So thank you all.